Hey everybody, today's guest is Chris Rowe, lead vocalist and guitarist for the Southern California punk rock band, The Ataris. Together, we dissect the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the first single, In This Diary, taken from their 2003 major label debut, So Long Astoria. I was pretty far off in my lyrical assumption with this one. I completely thought it pertained to one thing, but Chris enlightened me, albeit telling me there was a tiny bit of bleed over from my initial thought. Chris is a great storyteller, and there is a lot of lyrical imagery here. He mentioned that the lyrics and arrangement of the track didn't change very much from the initial demo that he recorded, the main differences being all the little production nuances that came later during the actual recording. Chris credits producer Lou Giordano with teaching him how to build a song dynamically, something Chris admitted not knowing as much about as a younger songwriter. And speaking of Lou Giordano, he's the first producer on Chris to Makes a Podcast to be credited with saving someone's life. That someone being Chris Rowe. But you're going to have to listen through to hear exactly how. So for that and a whole lot more, stick around. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris to Makes a Podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris to Makes a Podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Chris to Makes a Podcast. Chris, long time no talk. What's up, buddy? Hey, how are you doing? Thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm a huge fan. And I'm really excited to be on. Uh, that's what you told me. That's really cool that, uh, that you say so. Thank, thank you for the uh, for the kind words. You're welcome. I, it's, I, I've said all along, it's a, it's a really great concept for a podcast. To me, the, the greatest thing anyone could ever ask me in an interview is to like dive deeper into like the storytelling and songwriting. So when I saw you made a podcast doing just that, I was like, damn. That's a great idea. I wish I thought of it first. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, yeah. you know, I, I love your story. First off, it's crazy. I've known you for about 25 years now. I don't know, I don't know where the time went, but uh, I love your story. And there's a lot of parallels I feel with me. I was just this suburban kid that, uh, you know, listened to the radio and, and, and tried to listen to and absorb as much different uh, styles of music as I could. You're from Anderson, Indiana, of all places. Like, how far is that from like Bloomington or Indianapolis, like the big cities? Growing up, we would go to shows. That's the good thing about living in the Midwest is that we could go to shows in Chicago, uh, all the clubs there, Cincinnati at Bogarts, uh, St. Louis is a little further, Cleveland. You have all these places around. And I was about uh, maybe like 35 minutes outside of Indianapolis to the Northeast. Bloomington's way down South. And occasionally there'd be something good come through there. But Indianapolis, if fans would play there, it would be at a bar. It was like a B market. Actually, no, a D market. Um, and uh, <laughs> like the Ramones played there, but it was 21 and over. And I made a fake ID to try to get in. And then they caught it. I was going to interview uh, Joey and Johnny for a uh, Z night day at the time. And uh, the tour man manager, Monty Melnick, was like, okay, come on in. And the club, I beat me just to get in before the doors to, to interview them. And that was like the epitome of like a metaphor for what Indiana was with the music scene. Like uh, I snuck in to see all play on, uh, on the Breaking Things tour. I saw them play in like Percolator, but we had to go to Bogarts and then we had to go to Chicago and yeah, it was weird. I mean, you lived, did you grow up your whole life in Gainesville or that area? Uh, well, about three hours south of Gainesville. You know, Gain Gainesville, as, as my listeners know, is kind of like my musical mecca when I went there. Yeah. It was, th three hours south couldn't have been uh, more of a different place than Gainesville. So, you know, I was just, again, it was it was MTV or what was on the radio till basically I got out of high school. And Vinny, a less than Jake's former drummer, he taught me basically what to do with punk rock, like getting zines and, and sending away for seven inches and all that totally. kind of stuff. You know, dude, that's a total parallel for me, too. I grew up uh, first discovered like Kiss in the 70s. Uh, I was born in 77, but I, you know, I had a cool father who just had a great record collection of like, you know, all the great classic rock Zeppelin, the Stones, Sabbath. He liked a lot of the harder stuff. So through him, I, I uh, he saw, uh, you know, I remember like Kiss were on the 321 Contact or uh, like the <laughs> PBS show, it was, like Sesame Street. And then it was like, uh, the electric company and three, two, one contact this whole bit about kiss and, you know, all the stage, how they set up a stage and they showed the show and the production. And I was like that. And I just, I remember being two years old and just doing that, you know, the whole tongue out. And, you know, I, my parents would get me like these, like kiss had, you know, they were 
moguls for uh, uh, merchandise and they had these Kiss guitars and I would break them like, like Kiss did. And my parents like, no, you can't do that. They have like a hundred of those and they had to glue it back together. And, uh, but from Kiss, I went to like, you know, the first two Motley Crue albums. And then I remember Metallica and Slayer. And then through them, it was like, oh, I see Cliff wear like Misfit shirts. And what's that? Well, yeah, exactly. It was your gateway. Like Thrash was the gateway to punk. And then when I discovered all, it, it like changed my life. Like I loved all before the Descendants. I loved the Descendants. But to me, it was all, Aurora's Revenge Like was like, these songs really spoke to me and and i also loved like indie stuff like the sonic sonic youth and darso jr and my bloody valentine but i just wasn't good enough to play that so like all the power pop elements of like ramones and descendants that spoke to me as a player and uh that was my gateway just like you and then just like you said with zines man like max and rock and roll and then no idea from gainesville like uh sure. that and then flip side it was like all of the like uh, the, those indie labels and 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 the zines that supported those indie labels that that was my gateway. Absolutely, it was so exciting. It was an exciting time because for me as this young uh, teenager, it was like, whoa, there's there's other stuff besides MTV and radio. There's other music. There's other. What is this? It was just a whole other world. I got to look into. You're preaching to the choir about all. I was a huge all fan first. Then I yes. became a Descendants fan. <laughs> so I hear you on that. But there was a at least. In my early years of touring, you could probably relate to this. There was one or two or three Chris Rose in every city we'd go to. These just advantageous go-getters. Here's my demo. Here's my zine. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, man. Hey, man. Just say I it. Yeah, just say I... it. Nerds. <laughs> yeah. No, but, you know, um, not all of them got to, to do what you've done and get as far, you know. But you had that tenacity. I always admired that. You know, Thanks. you were recording four-track demos in your bedroom. And you mentioned Bogarts in Cincinnati. I guess that's where uh, you gave a roadie uh, of the Vandals to give a tape to Joe Escalante. And he contacted you uh, about being on Kung Fu Records. And uh, your first album, Anywhere But Here, was released on Kung Fu in April of 97. That had to be mind-blowing yeah yeah when they first reached out to me i thought it was somebody playing a prank uh <laughs> I, I swear i was like what because you gotta understand as you know a kid in the midwest i would only record songs on my four track programming all the drums with my elisa's drum machine writing all the parts because i couldn't find a drummer and i wasn't trying to get signed i was trying there was a one ad for a drummer in my demo and i was giving it to people like if you know a drummer please pass them on because nobody in small town Indiana can afford a drum set. Every idiot has a guitar, but man, like it was so hard to find a drummer. So we literally played shows as a really tight power pop band. It's two guys and a drum machine. We opened for Avail. We opened for <laughs> Citizen That's Fish, awesome. uh, Mr. T experience, so many bands because the knucklehead who ran the Emerson in Indianapolis, he put us on shows because we had unlimited coffee cards from Kinko's because our buddy worked there. We'd go there at night and he'd just be like, he'd give us a master card and we could just print flyers. So we did this guy's job for him promoting his shows and we'd play for free. Ultimately, we wanted to find a drummer. So Joe and them, they, they introduced me to Derek Floyd, who was the drummer, the previous drummer of Lagwagon. Mm -hmm. um, but I had known that he had struggled with, with addiction, heroin specifically, and but at me, you know, I was young and green and that was very something you didn't know about in Indiana. So I was like, how bad could this be? Let's just give it a shot. And, you know, they flew me out to uh, California and I recorded my fir that first record and um, just me and Derek. But it was evidently, you know, it was evident that this was going to be a problem. Uh, so that kind of fizzled and I never really, we never played shows. I went back to Indiana. I thought like, well, at least I did this. But like, you know, a year later or so, Derek reached out and somehow it's like hey let's try this and and i got i ended up moving to california in 90 it must be 90 early 90 no it must have been 98 i don't know i'm so bad with dates but nonetheless i moved out there we played a handful of shows with derek and marco 72 playing bass but ultimately that lineup just didn't work and that's when i started playing with mike davenport and chris knapp who became part of the lineup that was on so long Astoria, and we went through a few guitars before we finally found John Calora. Uh, we met him on tour. He was out 
touring with us. There's an opening band that were on Fearless. And then John, Chris, and Mike were kind of the core of, the, of this band for the longest time. Yeah, and that that's where we met John. We played with Beefcake, his, his old band years ago. So yeah. we knew him before he got with you. And, and of course, you know, I first heard of you or remember being aware around 99 uh, when Blue Skies Broken Hearts Next 12 Exits was released. And it was like... There was just this buzz on you guys. It was like that. Yeah. That to me is when when things started happening for you. The album was produced by Joey Cape, and uh, then uh, two years later, you recorded "End Is Forever," and that's when Less Than Jake toured with you guys. That's when we were out on the road with you, and I believe wasn't Sugar Cult with us on that run? Uh, I can't recall. If they were. They, I, if you say so, I, I'll believe you. We did a lot of shows with them at that time because yeah. they were they were our friends and and coming up at the same time. But uh, I can't recall who was on there. But yeah, that was, and it was also you. You guys were friends with Bill and Stefan and the Descents guys, and yes. they had they. We did "End Is Forever" at that studio, and then the EP on Fat Records uh, that we recorded between Blue Skies and "End Is Forever" actually came out before Blue Skies, but we recorded uh, after Blue Skies. That was done at the Blasting Room too. So there was all these parallels between Less Than Jake and us at the time. It was a real cool thing that we ended up, you know, hanging out and doing shows and stuff. Absolutely. And it, it was around this time that just everyone was getting signed. I yeah. mean, it was it was insane. I say everyone. It was everyone was out there putting in the work. Uh, we all at least had a shot. We were getting looked at by the majors. That was around the time we got our second major label deal. We were on Capitol, as you know, in the 90s, got re-signed to Warner Brothers. But you guys got picked up by Columbia. And uh, that's when you released So Long Astoria, which we're going to talk about in this diary today. Great. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a big thing for us. You know, like I always felt like I really wanted to make sure when we did go to a major label, it was something that was very organic. Since Blue Skies came out, we had had labels that had, you know, constantly expressed interest because we were just touring nonstop. And I always believed that you go out and you spread the word organically by getting in a band and bringing the music to the people. Remind, mind you, for younger people listening, this was pre-internet really, you know, or at least internet as we know it today you couldn't just upload your songs and everybody heard it you had to like take the music to the people and i just remember the biggest difference is we were on the i've told the story a few times but we were on the west coast plane and suddenly well this is more uh prior to a story but we were on the west coast plane and suddenly that song san dimas people started hearing it on the fat records comp and i remember we played a basement in, in albuquerque at a bagel shop Five people showed up. We got paid with a bag of Dale bagels. And by the time we got to the to the East Coast, there were like 200 people to shows. And it was like, that was when I first saw it catching on. But then after we did In This Forever, I felt that was like kind of as much as we could really do on Kung Fu. I'm forever grateful to Joe Escalani for, you know, putting, believing us and, and discovering the music. And then grateful to Fat Mike for you know putting out that ep and and giving giving kung fu the launch pack because nobody knew that label at the time and san dimas being on that comp and that mike putting out look forward to failure before blue skies then blue skies came that was like november and then blue skies came out the following like the following february or march so it was it was the launch pad it needed or something you know i'm bad with dates but that was kind of the gist so a story it was like the next step it was like I, we had completed our contract at Kung Fu. I was like, Sony, like they signed our friend Glenn Phillips, who you also uh, had interviewed. I saw yeah from, from Toe the West Rocket. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, you know, they were one of the labels we were talking to us. And I asked Glenn, I was like, you know, what do you think? And he was like, dude, they were a great, great label that really allowed us to just be artists and never intervened. And if you want to want a label that will just let you do that. And I know, you know, and he knew how I just wanted to take a modest deal and keep all creative control. I always was a stickler about the art, the package, the, you know, the photographs, everything, the stories and the songs. And they never once said anything. The only thing I think they ever said was like, like we think it's great. We believe in it. And, and they just gave us a platform to reach more people. And, uh, you know, us leaving Sony was only because that was around the time all the labels started dissipating. And in the present, it was actually like, we got word he was going to step down. So we went to him and we said, is this true? And he was like, yeah. And like, can we be let go? He was like, no problem. So it was actually a good, like the best case scenario. So many bands we know had their albums stuck and shelved, but we oh, were yeah. able to take the album we were working on and leave and then bring it to another label. So it was, uh, it was a good thing, but uh, I was, I was grateful for my time in Sony and everybody we work with there. 99% of the people we work with there, the radio guy was kind of a, 
a douche, but uh, you know, that's, <laughs> he, you know, there's that, they're not all going to be great, but, but our A&R guys, they were, they were great people. And uh, everybody, our, man, our manager at the time, super sweet guy. I owe a lot to him too, Darren. He was a great, great fellow, still friends. So yeah, it's good experience, you know? So, yeah, I, I always chalked up the major labels. It's like, you know, we wouldn't be where we're at if it wasn't for, you know, everything was meant to be how it was, how it was meant to be. Yeah. That's how, that that's how I see it. Well, in this diary it was released on February 11th, 2003. It preceded the record by a little less than a month. The album came out uh, so long a story on March 4th of 03. So uh, this was the first single you did a video for it. I also noticed that you uh, recorded at three different studios. You recorded at ocean studios in Burbank, uh, also orange whip in Santa Barbara, but you recorded at grand, master and we did a record there just before you guys did uh with andrew ellicle so (laughs) yeah he's a nice guy yeah well it's it's it wasn't really like we did the drums at ocean i'm a big analog guy so my whole thing was like i really want to do it you know all analog tape uh, and 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 that's kind of what i went into doing we did the uh did the drums at ocean and burbank and then uh we only moved over to uh, Grandmaster, because it was like, we don't need this big room for doing guitars. You know, there were good room sounds there, you know, at the other studio. And like, I mean, I guess I'll say we, we chose, uh, I'm sh- maybe you'll mention this there, uh, later, but uh, we chose Lou Giordano because he had done a lot of records I loved, like the Sugar Bob Mould's um, band after Who's Could Do, that album Copper Blue. Uh, he, he'd worked with Paul Westerberg, Sam I Am Clumsy. Yeah, he was just in that world of people who wrote very good, just rock, genreless rock albums. Like, you know, the Color and the Shape by the Foo Fighters or Weezer Blue album or like uh, Jimmy World, uh, Bleed American. Th- those are albums that like all walks of life love them. And that's when I went into writing So Long Astoria. I did like have this preconceived thing, but all I knew is that like I want an album. It's not a punk album. It's nothing. It's just like songs that speak to everyone and that's really kind of what i approached it as it's like this is going to be likely the biggest amount of people that ever hear our band so when this comes out i want it to be the thing i'm most proud of and i don't want any filler and every song has to have its purpose and i just you know we recorded the whole album at orange whip first and demoed it all and and basically had it like as is and then we went and re-recorded it with Lou as the record. So that's why we listed Orange Whip as well, because there were some little bits and pieces after that, that I added uh, that I need, still needed to be done, some backing vocals and percussion. And um, we used a little bit of pieces from the demos, like some of the vocals I liked on the demos. So he just flew them into, uh, the, you know, we, we did some editing at the end in Pro Tools and, and added, added some vocals from, from the actual demo versions that we did at Orange Whip. Because I was like, man, this has an honesty to it that I just, if I re-sang it, it, to me, it just wouldn't sound as honest as that first time I sang it. Uh, but most of them, I did the vocals at uh, Grandmaster and as well as the guitars. But yeah. Yeah, I, I love Lou's productions. You know, he's done uh, Sunday Day Real Estate, Goo Goo yeah. Dolls, Taking Back Sunday. That Copper Blue record's one of my all probably top 10 favorite records ever. Great album. And, uh, great album. I, it, it actually got me to go back and really dig into Husker Du because when I, first, when I first heard them in the 80s, the production was just a little too raw. And it's interesting that Lou was their sound guy back in the 80s. Yeah. So he, he was hearing them every night and finally he went, I know how to record this band. And he, and he killed it with Copper Blue, man. He killed it. I agree. You know, the funny thing I learned on that, not to talk about a bunch of other bands and nerd out on music, but, uh, <laughs> you know, Beaster, the thing after it, that was that was all the same session as Copper Blue. So I mm-hmm. always thought it was a different thing. It was more edgy, but like Copper Blue, man, there's so many good songs on that. And same with Gooby Doll's Boy Named Goo. He told me this great story about how Resnick just heard that song name as a throwaway. And, and Lou's like, I got to do Lou voice. It's like, no, that that's that sounds just, that's a hit. And and once they got it done, like you know, the rest is history. But like, it just shows you sometimes as a songwriter, the song you might hear that you've written, you have this thing in your head that the way you hear it, and once somebody else hears it, they might perceive it as a whole different thing. Like it's that's a really cool thing, you know. And uh, yeah, he had a lot of great stories. My favorite was the Paul, you know, I love The Replacements, one of my favorite bands. And he told me Paul Westerberg, when he was doing his album, uh, I think it was eventually, 
he had uh, he made this edit on one of the songs and uh, there was like a mistake in it. And Westerberg went out to have a smoke or some food and he came back and he played it back and goes, hey, wait, play that back. And they, he's like, <laughs> what happened to that mistake? And, he, and Lou was like, I, I fixed it. I cut the tape and edited. He's like, <laughs> put that back. We made our whole career on those mistakes. <laughs> yeah, it's true, they're... man. It was so great. He's a great guy. I love Luger. I mean, I owe so much to him. Dude, saved my life. I choked on. We went out and had a. We were in a hurry during pre-production. We went out and had a sandwich. Came back in. Was eating in a hurry. I choked on some bread from a sandwich, and he gave me a Heimlich maneuver and saved my life. Like, how many producers can you say not only made a great record, but he saved my fucking life, literally. <laughs> This is a first on Krista Makes a Podcast, folks. A producer yep. uh, has given the Heim- Heimlich maneuver to somebody and saved their life. That, yes, he, he did. I, I literally, the, the, it was disgusting, but the bread and the, I took a drink of my soda to try to wash it down, and all this, the, the liquid and the bread all over the soundboard <laughs> because it was, I was dying. I was turning blue. It was, it was fucking nuts, man. But yeah, so I, was, I owe a lot to Lou, and I'll, I'll never, I'll uh, always be very gracious of that dude, you know, nothing but great things. <laughs> That's very cool. I want, I want to jump into the song now. It's three minutes and 54 seconds for, it's it's kind of a longer song, almost pushed in four minutes, but it, I've said it before in the show, it doesn't feel like it. The intro is eight bars of eighth note palm muted stereo guitars, uh, and then a cymbal crash and a kick drum bring us into verse one. <laughs> Here in this diary, I write you visions of my summer. It was the best I ever had. There were choruses and sing-alongs and that unspoken feeling of knowing that right now is all that matters. All the nights we stayed up talking, listening to 80s songs, and quoting lines from all those movies that we love, it still brings a smile to my face. Okay, so the first half of that, I just really wanted to encapsulate that feeling of being free and out there on the road at night like i remember pulling into a truck stop in like laramie wyoming it was one of our first actual tours in a bus i get off the bus we're in this truck stop parking lot it was this feeling of just being young and free and not worrying about anywhere else i was but that very moment i just remember walking into that truck stop and i heard uh, George Strait, I can still make Cheyenne over the over the radio. It was like one in the morning. I was out having the time of my life, just hanging out with my friends, and just this feeling of like, this is the only place I want to be is right now in this moment. Like, there's this line in this Jane's Addiction song uh, that I always loved uh, in Classic Girl that says, "You know, some may say that those were the days, but in many ways, you know, for us, these are the days." And I just always kind of like saw that as like, seize the day in this moment, just live it to the fullest and, you know, try not to be one of those people, which I very much am, that plans the next moment, but try to savor the moment you're in. So that was just me trying to say, like, I am trying to savor this moment and really just write every little vivid detail of the things I was feeling and seeing, uh, hanging out like the 80 song saying it was one night on the, the, it was the first, well, we did work tour a bunch, but that year, uh, pre so long story and promoting so long story, we we did warped. And I remember Pat from No Motive came on our bus, and he, you know, it was one of those things. As you remember, people would like hitch a ride with you from other bands sometimes oh, and yeah. hang out. You'd hang out, watch movies. So that night, we sit up in the. Everybody else went to sleep, and me and him just sit up in the front lounge of the tour bus, just passing the guitar back and forth. And you know, I'm like a eighty. I'm a jukebox for songs. If you hand me a guitar and just name it, I'll play it. I can play everything by ear. I'm the fucking jukebox so he would be like all right play this and we would just play and sing and we would just like 
One Night Love Affair by Brian Adams. All right. One Night Love Affair. And we back and forth. We're like, uh, all right, fucking, uh, you know, we, and we did that. And this was like hours of that. So the that was me and him sitting in the front bus lounge. I don't even know if you ever knew this. I never talked about that. But That's really um, interesting, Chris, because I when I read these lyrics. It's not all about a girl, man. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, I'll, I'll tell you kidding. what I, no, I'll, t- I'll tell you what I took it as. I took it as this was you reminiscing of being that uh, suburbanite kid back in Anderson in Indiana. I thought that's what you were writing about. That's what it felt like to me. There's definitely some of that all over so long the story of the album. Uh, but yeah. in this diary, because it's saying here in this diary, this is a, a actual literal or metaphorical diary of everything that was happening more in that summer, oh, in cool. that moment, and less in the nostalgic past. Although... I was going to go and listen to the song once. I play it in every set, but I was going to listen to it before we did this podcast because I was like, I wanted to refresh my memory of some of the lines. But I'm like, no, nah, I want it to be just jog my memory in the moment. So it's really <laughs> off the cuff, but there might be some of that in later verses. I'll, I'll tell you if there is, but definitely more about in that specific moment and summer of, well, I guess I was writing it. I probably wrote it like 2002 summer. I'm, or, yeah. Cause we were on warp tour, I think in 02 and 03, I think. So it was definitely, yeah, the summer writing the album before uh, we released it. That was probably when I wrote it. And did the song go through much evolution from the when you initially recorded the demo at Orange Whip, or when you when you initially recorded on acoustic guitar to to what we're hearing now on the record? Yeah, there's there's probably an acoustic version, and then we did the so long a story of demos LP where the demo of this is on there, and you'll hear the the main thing that happened, and the main thing I learned from Lou Giordano is he was like. Every song should have peaks and valleys. When this, this demo started out more just like, not clean, but like more, it wasn't palmed. It started out more like, blah, nah, 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 nah. It was, instead of, jin, 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 you know, it was like uh, open. So when you got to the verse, it was open again. And he was like, peaks and valleys. He's like, every song, like if you look at a song, to him, his whole, like, like Copper Blue, those songs are kind of formulaic, but not generic. And I was always like, if you look at San Dimas, that was a young kid who didn't have any idea of structure. He just sat down with the guitar and just like, okay, I'm going to write a song. And yeah. there was no chorus, there was no verse, but somehow in all that beautiful chaos, it works. But with Diary, it was one of those first songs where I was like, okay, there is a structure. There's a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, big double outro chorus. And that's kind of, except for like eight of nine and some of these songs that have those big kind of drony, you know, shoegazy, jawbreakery outros like you hear on like Dear You and stuff. I love that stuff too. We do that like Boyfriend Sucks Live and stuff. But like this was one of those first songs where I was like, the demo was really open and, and, and all across the board. There was no peaks and valleys. So in this version, I palmed those intros and go straight into the to the verse. And uh, on the demo, it was like open and then into the verse. There was no, yeah, it was like very straight across. Uh, didn't have any peaks and valleys. Yeah, sounds like Lou taught you a lot about dynamics. That's what it sounded like. He did, and, I, and that was one of those lessons I carried with me a lot. Like I, I learned, like you know, don't overthink it and don't like doesn't everything has to be formulaic, but like, you know, you can't deny that if you like, listen to like, even, even the Beatles in the weird era, like, you know, there were formula, but the pro- the cool thing is, is you can start a song with formula and then deconstruct it and then like, be like, all right, well, maybe in this last chorus, let's like take that out and do some, something that's like different and, and really, you know, adds like, add like this big, like reprieve from it and then go back to something like you can do that. But like, I feel you need a solid foundation first. And Lou definitely taught me how to focus on an actual, uh, yeah, an actual dynamic, an actual formula and uh, then, then work backwards from there. You know? Hey everybody, don't go anywhere. We got lots more with Chris Rowe after a few words from our sponsors. 
What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com, and I'll see you there. And now, back to the show. Well, on this double verse, we get harmonies on Now is All That Matters, and on the line, it still brings a smile to my face. Quite a bit going on here. The drums, bass, and... the there's bigger and slightly more overdriven stereo guitars that are in on this verse, bigger than uh, what, what is in the intro. Playing those eighth note palm mutes, there's tambourine on all the snare hits here. On the word chorus is the third line, an arpeggiated guitar lick is kind of panned off right. Had, there were choruses and sing-alongs, and that is spoken feeling. This lick, Chris, is kind of the central theme. It's kind of a hook within this song. It happens in the choruses, albeit a little bit uh, different phrasing. Uh, on the line of knowing, uh, until the word matters that we get that harmony on, the stereo guitars open up for four bars, uh, which I'm calling, it's kind of like a reset before the second half of verse one. The second half of verse one, those stereos break back down to the palm mutes. On the line, uh, the third line there, uh, the arpeggiated lick, that noodle, panned off right, comes back. The last line with the harmony, the stereos open back up again. And there's a slight feedback panned off right as we get in to pre-chorus one. I guess when it comes down to it. Stereo guitars are open here, there, and they're also joined by an octave guitar. And the lyric here is, I guess, when it comes down to it, which is the setup for chorus one. Being grown up isn't half as fun as growing up. These are the best days of our lives. The only thing that matters is just following your heart. And eventually, you'll finally get it right. You know, with choruses for me, I always feel like the narrative and, you know, the verse is my strong suit. Because that's the place in the song where you can really tell a story. You can really add in all of those little details and, like, idiosyncrasies and things that, you know, you see. I'm a very much of I'm a, a very much a stream of consciousness writer. When I'm out driving, traveling on the road, I just write the things I see and I try to do it with as much descriptive detail as possible. And that's what I think songwriting is to me. It's like the photographs I take, like that blue sky sign, everything, like just trying to write that imagery in the song. Choruses, on the other hand, I always feel like I fall short. It's the summary of everything you're saying in the verses, but I don't feel you can write a good chorus that really is fucking wordy because if you do you're not going to be able to sing it and it, <laughs> and it and it would just feel like an extension of the verse so like you said the first line is like i guess when it comes down to it it's like me just kind of linking the verse to the chorus and saying all right all these things i'm saying in the verse this is me encapsulating this feeling that now when we're young the, these are the things we feel and these are the things that matter this moment and, uh, you know, I also feel like every day there's more and more responsibilities, which is something I think we all can relate to. I mean, at 45 now, uh, I do still have this feeling of like, I am very young at heart and very free to live how I want. But, you know, I've got, gone through a lot of crazy things after losing my father. Then I lost my, my French bulldog, Gracie, passed away and, and uh, just prior to the 2020. And then... I got COVID in, in March 2020 for five weeks, ended up in the hospital, almost died. Got it again in July 2020, uh, five weeks again. 
all of these things really kind of make you feel like you are no longer the invincible person you were when you're in your 20s and you're feeling like death is inevitable, but it's not something that in this moment, it, it's not the focal point of my worries uh, because, you know, it's just when we're young, it's just, it's how it is. It's a fact that we're, we're just living life like kind of with a reckless abandon, like, ah, whatever, you know, and, and uh, that was kind of, I guess, what I was trying to summarize is that, you know, all these feelings and these responsibilities and things like those things are creeping up on us, <laughs> but just enjoy the moment while we have it. And uh, even though, you know, the last line is like, eventually we'll try and get it right. I'd like to say I'm an eternal optimist, but I think, you know, it's always one of those things <clears throat> when you're 20, you think you have it all figured out. And you look back at 20 when you're 30 and you're like, I didn't know shit. And when you're 40, you look back at 30 and you, it's the same repeating thing. I don't think we ever figure it out. <laughs> but yeah. I do admit that the more I live through these big traumatic events or big inspiring events, things that you experience that really change your life and your worldview, be it traveling or be it, you know, having a daughter at a young age or, you know, going through a divorce or heartbreak or losing your father or, or almost dying. All these things shape the way I feel and think. And I, I definitely feel like that does make me learn from those things and be a better person. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of what I was trying to say. <laughs> okay, well, th this is interesting. You know, it, this chorus definitely lifts. You know, you kind of go up an octave here vocally, but there's no harmonies here. Was that ever discussed? Because there's harmonies on the first verse. I do all the harmonies on stuff for uh, every record from So Long Story Back. Uh, uh, later stuff, Bob Hope from Pollen and Go Reflex, mm -hmm. who records us, he, he does... The, most of the harmonies, but uh, I think it was a thing there where I always kind of felt the first chorus shouldn't, you, you don't want to give away too much and, and, and because then when you get to your last chorus, where are you going to go from there? It's kind of like with, with vocal melodies, if you go straight to a high melody in your verse, you know, unless you're like fucking Mariah Carey, where are you, where are you going to go from a high? You're going to go to like a, 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 a high C? No, that would be ridiculous. You'd sound like one of those you know, screamo emo bands, you know, the noodly math rock bands. But no, I, I don't. Yeah, it's probably me thinking like, and probably me and Lou was like, yeah, this doesn't need a chorus, or a, a chorus harmony or anything. It can lift with guitars. It, we'll add an extra guitar or something or a guitar melody or yeah. Or, yeah. And we'll say harmonies on courses if they do happen. I don't remember. I want to be the anti harmony band live. Always have one singer live. Any of that stuff we do in the records. That's like how I record them. But live, I like to like be really bare bones, no frills, just two guitars, bass, drums, one vocal, no backdrop, just fucking minimalist. This, yeah, that's me. That <laughs> makes just, sense. Now, yeah. now it, it's very subtle. If it is, were the vocals doubled in this chorus? Yeah, I, I think on a lot of this record, I, I don't know why, but it, I, maybe it was because I really loved how a couple, uh, like Dear You, for instance, like Blake doubled, like I think all the vocals on that record and. I mean, even if you listen to like my Lucas College, I mean, there's a lot of vocals on that record doubled. I don't really do that anymore because I feel there's just a certain natural honesty to just a singular vocal. And if you double like a word or two because to emphasize what it's saying, sure. But yeah, I, I think on this, I went a little double crazy. And the way we play the songs live really feels a little bit more natural feeling. I had to listen closely because it's like I said, it's a subtle double if there is. Um, on the best days of our lives, that line, the guitar lick reminiscent of that verse lick is panned off right. That comes in for two bars. On the third line, the only thing that matters is just following your heart. There's an octave guitar for one bar. And at the end of the chorus, we come back into a four bar reintro with those smaller intro stereo guitars with what I'm calling, Chris, a trippy video game sounding synth that's kind of swirling, oh. swirling around. What's happening there? Right. I, re I really loved a lot of like the, the ear candy that like, uh, there's this band from Australia that I heard when we were touring over there called Lotel. They have an album called Planet of the Stereos. Like, check out the song, Pop Song, Save My Life, or Teenager of the Year. They, they're they a three-piece, but they had a lot of, I guess I guess to me, like, it, it was, again, just like Color in the Shape, or Weezer, Blue Album, or Jimmy World Bleed American, where it was just great rock songs, but it had little bits of ear candy, like Bleed American did, too. And I really liked that kind of thing, and I just felt like 
all right, I'm going to add some of that stuff there. I don't remember specifically what I used for that sound, but like there's another song on the album, Summer 79, where I did specifically try to, where, where the line in that song said something about like being at a roller rink. And I was in the, in, in my memory, I was playing video games at like the skating party as, as, a, as a school kid. And so I made it try to, I, I used like some samples of an arcade that I, I went out and got like, you know, actual, I would go out and like do field recordings and use them. So I, I don't know if I was going for that in the song, but maybe I just copied myself twice. I don't know. And maybe it was meant to sound like that, but yeah. <laughs> well, and, and spoiler alert, there is no harmonies in the choruses of this song. So, okay. <laughs> See, but, you know better than me. But yeah, because I listened to it. You, you know, like I always joke yeah. on the show, you don't usually sit around and listen to our own stuff. So I get it. <laughs> yeah. Like I play the song every show, but like the way we play it live, even some of the parts, like just it's the same heart, but it's just and mostly the same arrangement. But just you know, as you become a better guitar player and singer, like I like to change up melodies, and I don't like I said we don't do harmonies or doubles or any of that crap live. So yeah, I don't remember how I have I don't remember how this sounds on the recording. Is what I'm saying. Only I remember in my head how I'm playing it the last time I played it. It's a trip. When I go back and have to learn songs we haven't played in like 10 or 15 years, I'm like, I'll listen to it be like, it's just totally different than what I what I remember it as. Yeah. You know, time, time distorts it for some reason. But right after that four-bar reintro, we're into verse two. Breaking into hotels, swimming pools, and wreaking havoc on a world. Hanging out at truck stops just to pass the time. Breaking into hotel swimming pools and wreaking havoc on our world. Hanging out at truck stops just to pass the time. The black top singing me to sleep. Lighting fireworks in parking lots illuminate the blackest nights. Cherry cokes under this moonlit summer sky. 2015 Riverside. It's time to say goodbye. There's a lot, there's a lot of like little inside things there. I guess if we break it down with the first it's the line of the first the, see if I can remember the, yeah, the break, line. Break, breaking into hotel swimming pools okay. and wreaking havoc on our world. So that was harking back sort of to the first tour I ever did. I, I think that, that happened a couple of times. There was a couple specific tour stories, but uh, first tour I ever did, it was us, the Vandals and MXPX. This was actually a few of the shows we played with Derek and Marco 72. And uh, it was one of the first nights I remember, like, you know, uh, the Vandals did this tour with a terrible name called Turb Town Tour, because they specifically, for some reason, booked a tour of all of the D-list markets of uh, California, Nevada. Like they played like Sparks, Nevada, uh, uh, Modesto. Uh, they, we played Tijuana, which was great. Uh, but all these places that like bands didn't normally play. So I remember we got along really well with MXPX. That was the first time that we had hung out. I mean, I think we met him at the Emerson one time at their show. But I remember hitting off because we were the same age. We both liked the same music. They were big all fans. And, and like Derek, you know, we didn't really hang out much. We played music. I respect him as a player. But like I said, he was very quiet. He had, he had a lot of issues and, and it just wasn't working out. So it was nice to have some camaraderie with some friends. So on that tour, we broke into after hours to the, to the pool. It was the first time I think I ever drank alcohol. I was like 19. I never drank as a kid. And we like had them buy us, like Derek or somebody bought us some booze. <laughs> And we all like hung out and just like, just did stupid crap. And like Derek walked through the halls naked, wrapped a towel around him and like, it was just dumb stuff you do as kids. And, uh, and that, I think that was the, the specific incident. There was another time in Las Vegas where like I hung out with some friends and we, this is when I used to drink. I've been like eight years sober, but we got really drunk and pulled all the furniture from the hallway into the hotel elevator and rode it up and down for two hours, drinking off of a bottle of whiskey and just talking and telling stories while people got on and off. We'd be like, hey. Uh, and that night ended with us going out to the hotel pool and jumping in with all our clothes on and getting evicted from the hotel. 
So the, it was one of those two, or maybe a culmination of both. That was that one. And then uh, the lighting fireworks and parking lots, that was on Warp Tour. I was probably the person that year that got fireworks banned from the tour. And I'm not saying that I'm, that's a real thing. I think Kevin Lyman would probably back that up because I bought this brick of firecrackers that was the size of a car. It was one of those ones that cost like a hundred dollars, something stupid. That's like, you could put your hands out in a giant circle and it was bigger than that. And at the barbecue, I unbeknownst to anyone waiting in the line to get their food, lit it off. And I remember Brody from the distillers like trying to stomp it out and get it to stop, but it just went on for over 25 or 30 minutes and it just <laughs> bummed everybody out. And I was just like, you know, I was a young kid from Indiana. We would like fireworks in July and it was in little July and we were just being stupid. I remember like Fletcher shooting Roman candles at Joe while he's fishing on one of the lakes behind one of the amphitheater. And uh, the fireworks thing, I actually think I used that footage in a video I did on Make It Last, uh, when we re-released Anywhere But Here, you can probably find that somewhere in there. It's, it's just all this tour footage I used for that video. And that specific moment I used it in that video. But I think you'll see the fireworks going off. I think so. Uh, but anyway, that was that. The address? Now, see, the address yeah. is what threw me off. Because I'm That's... reading some of these I'm reading some of these lyrics. I'm going, <laughs> the Black Talk sing me to sleep like was that on the tour bus or was yeah. that like driving in the back was that like driving in the back of your dad's car because no. of the line 2015 riverside i thought that was talking about maybe your childhood so this was all just different memories of that tour and just like except for like the, the hotel swimming pools there might have been some of the you know we would occasionally do the pools thing just break in and, and go swim night swimming you know rem but um yeah so the the uh the black top yeah that was me on the bus i would always remember that i'd feel most at peace when i just sit there listening to the row beneath me so the 2015 riverside thing the, the original demo had a whole other address in there of, of a person at the time that that was really you know near and dear to me but being that uh, i didn't want to in, incriminate anyone and put their actual address in the song i nixed that took it out and I used the address of the club, the back booth in Austin. So that is the address of oh. the back booth in Austin, <laughs> Texas, because they were from this area and, in fact, lived very close to there. Uh, still friends to this day, wonderful person. But, uh, you know, it was just that. And, and the, the time to say goodbye thing is, is we hung out a bit that summer for like four or five days in work tour. And that was me getting, walking them onto the Greyhound. Uh, you know, get on the bus. It's time to go. You know, that was me saying bye. You know, this is like, it's been an awesome time, you know, such a, a wonderful like bond and friendship and, and, and kinship, what have you. But it was like one of those things, like some of these beautiful moments might, might be fleeting or might be something that in the moment it, it, it feels like uh, you wish it would go on longer, but it was like that it, again, it was like wanting these moments to last forever, even knowing, even though knowing that sometimes you have to just like, take them for what they are, you know, because sometimes, you know, other things may be in the way or what have you. So that was kind of, that was kind of what that was, but yeah, okay. 2015 Riverside. Yeah. A lot well, of people are like, is that back to the future? I'm like, no, it's not fucking back to the future. That was, I don't remember that. It was, I guess it was, it was the Riverside, you know, where Riverside drive is. Yeah. It's a block past Maple near John F. Kennedy drive. No, I wouldn't write that. It was song. That'd be, yeah. Anyway. Well, verse two is structurally like a verse one, except we get three lines with harmonies here. The second line and wreaking havoc on our world, the blacktop singing me to sleep and 2015 Riverside, it's time to say goodbye, which leads us into pre-chorus two. Get on the bus, it's time to go. The lyric is get on the bus, it's time to go. There's a lyric change there. That uh, gets us into chorus two. You know, you were talking about a lot of times you want that chorus to hit you over the head. You know, I'll never forget. We had this A&R guy one time who just, he would say something like this, like, the chorus is too wordy here. What's the song called? He'd be like, <laughs> well, it's, call it's called In This Diary. He's like, well, yeah, can't you just say that over and over? In This Diary, In This Diary. It's like, dude, you, you don't get it, you know? And yeah. I think to your point, you know, there isn't a lyrical change here. Was that talked about of, of bringing some other theme in? Because it, it's all the same in the choruses. 
Roy was never really, I mean, none, none of the other guys would ever really chime in on songwriting. Except for John, John, he wrote, he started at this time, started writing music of his own. None of the other guys ever wrote lyrics. Mike actually wrote one, one tune uh, on Blue Skies that was a song from his old band. But other than that, it would usually just be like, I, I wouldn't have anyone to channel those ideas through. But Lou came in and he was more there to kind of help with the overall just taking the songs I already had and just adding input on like like I said giving me more, uh, some fatherly direction of dynamics and things like that and uh be like oh no there should be a chorus here this is a cor-. and and so I started to understand structure but but no I don't think there was ever anything talked about with that it was probably just like uh me just feeling that it was always about feeling for me and like and maybe in the moment I'm just like yeah this this just needs to be that, you know, what it was. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and I, and I, to your point of wanting people to have something to latch on and sing to, keeping yeah. it the same, keeping on the same definitely helps with that. Well, after chorus two, we go into a 16 bar. I'm calling it a breakdown bridge. It's back down to those smaller stereo guitars from the top. Uh, the synth again comes in, kind of panned off left. On the third bar, the hi-hat joins us. On the fourth bar, you say, get it right, which is kind of harking back to the last line in uh, the chorus. Bars five through eight, the kick and snare drum come in with a beat. And then there's another synth or a guitar, Chris, panned off to the right. Maybe a guitar through a flanger that is kind of mimicking that synth. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I would have to hear it, but I, I, I would imagine <laughs> it might it might be like a guitar and a synth because a, a, a couple of those things like I, I recall like the ear candy stuff. I layered some like little noodly synth things under the guitar thing to kind of like spread it out more or make it feel like a kind of a departure from just going to guitar. Like I I really wanted sonically like every song to have different sounds. We I was really a stickler. I love you know, old vintage guitars and drums, like use every song, I use different guitar tones and use different amps. Um, just because we, you know, we had the budget to finally like take our time with a record. And I really wanted to, uh, you know, have every song have its own feeling and it's and sonically and, you know, and songwriting wise. So that was, that was probably some of that. You know? Yeah. I can't tell if it's another synth that comes in panned off, right. That joins the other one, or if it's a guitar, uh, but, it, but it's definitely a cool sound. Bars 9 through 12, uh, the band continues what we were just talking about. And then on the 12th bar, you say get it right again. But this time, it's kind of like a processed delay vocal that happens there. And you you hold out the word right for quite a while, right before it hits some feedback on the guitar. It's panned off right that launches us into chorus three, which is the double chorus. But that part, like, you know, I know Lou mixed the record, that process vocal that did, was that something he came up with or you thought about? I, I think I really wanted the vocal to kind of extend and do this kind of like, I love a lot of old dub records, like Lee Scratch Perry and all that stuff. And I think I, I was like, why don't we put that through a space echo? So it would just, that, 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 you know how like a lot of those like old uh, trippy dub, great yeah. dub albums do. And uh, yeah, I use a Rolling Space Chorus, the Space Echo, like the, the tape one, a lot on Welcome the Night with some stuff. Like John Lennon used that a lot. That's the slap that he does. And they'd also do the, the, the analog tape trick where they would uh, mm-hmm. do it with that too. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's what that was, if I recall. But yeah, Lou, Lou wasn't like much of coming up with that kind of thing. Like he was, in fact, when it came to trippy stuff, that's, I think that's the reason why, why Lou and I kind of didn't end up working together Welcome to the Night. It wasn't that I, I didn't want to have him do another record. It was just that Lou is really, really amazing at doing those kind of records like I wanted to make with So Long a Story that are just a great, straightforward rock record. But I, after having a bunch of time off after So Long a Story and feeling like I was finally getting to a point where guitar-wise, I was able to play some of the more atmospheric uh, spacey, droney, shoegazy parts of, of of like the indie world that I loved as a kid. Uh, before I got into playing more power pop stuff, I was like, John and I both listened to all that world of music too, and it was like, man, like I don't I don't feel I could ever make so long a story again because 
at least at that point, I didn't think I wanted to make another rock record following that because I felt I did the best one I could and, it, and I was proud of it and I loved it. I was always at the belief you continue evolving and you make the next thing you're proud of. So to me, even though I know that I knew at the time that like I did not expect a lot of the people who just listened to that style of music to get that record, I didn't care. I just was making a cathartic thing like I did with Astoria or Blue Skies. And the next natural thing was to do Welcome to Night. So we didn't work with Lou on that because specifically he didn't really know how to add in put two weird ear candy stuff as much as like me bringing things to him and him just being an amazing engineer and really great producer. But, but I, I really wanted somebody who was good at creating like really different sounds like trippy things and stuff that like pushed me to do things differently. And uh, that's why Nick Lane did that album. He was, he was, you know, it was perfect for the record, but, but overall, Lou was great for Solon Astoria. And, and if I were making a record like that again, I, you know, I would, I would love to work with Lou again. That's awesome. Well, the chorus three is uh, the first double chorus in the song. That's pretty much how the song ends. Big grown up, is it half as fun as growing up? These are the best days of our lives The only thing that matters is just following your heart And eventually you'll finally get it right Being grown up isn't half as fun as growing up These are the best days of our lives first half again the same lyrics uh halfway through though there's this big drum fill with these pick slides that happen to to go back into uh to the second half of of chorus three again all the lyrics are the same on the first line though being grown up isn't half as fun as growing up there's a call and response after you say being grown up uh that happens there and there's a harmony on that call and response it's really cool Uh, how did that come about because that's something that i I went and watched i've I've seen you guys play this song you don't do that live again you have the minimalist approach yeah uh, that that's not your typical harmony it's an extra part that you don't do how'd that come about okay my my old thought with with doing stuff like that i'm always a big fan of the double chorus because one chorus a lot of the times just feels too short if you listen to like a lot of the songs in that record, Take Off Some Landings, My Reply, all of them have a double chorus because it just really hammers at home. But if you're going to do a double chorus, the second half has to have something different. And I usually like to have some kind of lead in that kind of separates the two. Because if you just have the same thing go again with nothing to differentiate the two, it just feels like it's going on and on. And so I definitely acknowledge that in my mind when making a making that kind of song or that kind of double chorus thing so i i I just remember feeling like hearing that whole like you know being grown up that 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 answer thing and uh it just felt like this is another thing to differentiate the second half and usually with you know and the drum fill going into it i just probably you know like this needs some some kind of large fill to kind of you know, and now this is announcing this is the second half. And, and then usually with the second half, you'll probably I would probably introduce like a melody line on or some more arpeggios that are different from the first half of the chorus. Right. Um, there's a lot of that. I know there's so much like extra guitar world. Like I was always like like Billy from Smashing Pumpkins would do like so many layers of guitar. So even though I'm like analog, very, very much into like organic stuff, I am also a big fan of just you know, like Queen and all these bands that would use analog technology and use the studio to create cool sounds, maybe knowing you're not going to be able to do it live. Like even Queen, if you see Bohemian Rhapsody live, they they use that middle section on video screen and then they (laughs) kick into, you know, then they kick in the, so you think you, they don't go and do that middle section because like, what are you going to, how are you going to do that live? So, um, you can't, <laughs> can't. you're going to have like a hundred singers on stage. I mean, you could with like, a, but anyway, so I, I just, I always approach the studio as like a tool to make something. And I'm going to n- probably always rearrange these songs slightly different live, but always try to keep the heart and the feeling. Yeah. You know? 
Well, to expound on your point about differentiation with, with you know, the, the last chorus here that being doubled, the line, these are the best days of our lives. On lives, you go, lives, the melody changes there, which, yeah. which changes it up. The octave guitars come in there, which is a different placement. It's a different octave part. And very last line, and eventually you'll get it right. The whole band retards there and then ends on the D flat chord. And the song comes to an end again. The song's three minutes and 54 seconds, but it doesn't feel like it when I was listening to it. It goes by a lot quicker than that. I don't think we did an, an edit for radio. There might have been one. Uh, and if it was, it was probably my idea because I am even, especially in that time, I am fully aware that radio single link was getting shorter and shorter. It used to be like anything below four minutes. But even then, you know, knowing that 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 record was what it was, I really tried to keep every song to a specific link, except the ones like eight of nine, which I just felt like, you know, they 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 are what they are. You know, they're they're the, like the great deep cut B sides. But I really felt like every song on that album was kind of like an A side, or you know, I approached it like that because uh, I you know I felt they were uh, they all deserved to be there, and they were all anthemic kind of you know single worthy type tunes i mean not to i never would say anything like uh you know g- big of my suffering but i did definitely felt like like i said going into it i wanted to write these very catchy formulaic kind of rock album and that and, and, it, and it turned out exactly what i wanted but um but yeah with the with the with the way it ends it's funny you mention that because the ataris have i don't think we've ever done a fade out on a single song every song you know, I was always a big fan. Like, always go, you know, the all <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I ripped that off all the time. And, <laughs> and and how a song like, you know, you said it does the retard. How how it's it you know it's you know gets slower as it you know it's, it gets slower. Yeah. Then. I, I do that a lot too. Like usually, all my songs tend to have some of that. That's how I feel in my mind. I always just I gravitate towards that. So I don't know why, but I, I'm gonna make a conscious effort to make a song have a fade out before I die. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think yeah. that this ends perfectly. And one last thing bef- before we break, Chris. So when, you know, you had mentioned earlier that Columbia was, you know, they, they kind of uh, let you have creative control. They, they let you have your say with things. Was this their choice for first single yours or was it a, was it a combined effort? No, I think they kind of let us have our way. Even like, I, I think I didn't mention this, even with the video, I was like, I want to go back to Anderson, Indiana and film this in, in, in Anderson because I really want to like, you know, represent and fly the flag for the town I was in. So we did. We, we used this like this old, you know, 50 style dairy made place. Again, that's why that's why I thought the song was about there because I saw the video. I just wanted to like, you know, again, all the visual imagery. And if you open up the, the booklet to that album, all it has all these little relics and things. I wanted the booklet to feel like a personal diary. Every relic in there is something that has a story behind it that belonged to me and was one of my personal objects. So every page has has stories behind every item. Like everything had to be there. In fact, Sergi from Sam I did the layout. He said it was one of the, the layouts he was most proud of that he did because you know, how it turned out. But he said it was also the biggest pain in his ass because of all that stuff. So um, <laughs> I commend him a lot for, for, for the job he did because I loved how it turned out. But yes, visually... The video and stuff, I want it to be extension of the feeling. But but um yeah, the video wasn't definitely following a narrative except for showing like this character is supposed to be me as I'm younger and also showing to me it looks supposed to look like my daughter as she's young. And just these parallels of our youth and stuff. But uh but yeah, uh, only by coincidence that uh having to be shot in Anderson was just more of me like wanting to represent the town I was from, you know. Right on. Well, hey, before we break, I, I understand you uh, have some some cool news you like to share with the listeners. It's kind of an exclusive here on uh, Krista Makes a Podcast. Yes, so let, yes, so yes. Let's, let's hear uh, it. Let's hear okay, it. Okay, so by the time this airs, I think you said like November 7th, this might have already broke, but hopefully it hasn't, and it's exclusive on my favorite <laughs> podcast. <laughs> but we're planning something really huge uh, for Los Angeles uh, for the 20, 20th anniversary of So Long Astoria which came out March 2003. So March of next year, uh, the Atari's uh, lineup from So Long Astoria with me, Mike Davenport, Chris Knapp, and John Calora, we're getting back together for one show in Los Angeles at the Wiltern Theater. Uh, it will be March 24th. And uh, we've got some really, really awesome, huge support bands uh, that we're working on locking in. Once we do that, the show will be announced and on sale. And the ticket link will be on our the Atari's Facebook and Instagram, uh, the link in the bio once we put it on sale. But um, 
Yeah, that will be the only date in 2023. There won't be a tour, like for the 10th anniversary, we did the Coast to Coast tour. But uh, yeah, no tour, just the date in LA. So if you want to see it, come to us. And uh, looking, definitely looking forward to playing some music with those guys again. And it's going to be a lot of fun, really special. We're going to make it like a big event. And uh, yeah, we're going to play the whole album in full, Soul and a Story album, plus some other fan favorites. Like you expect to hear like San Dimas and hopefully, uh, you know, some others from Blue Skies and Indus Forever and stuff. So it's going to be, it's going to be really cool. Yeah. Awesome, man. You're well, here cr- first. <laughs> heck yeah, heck yeah. Well, thank, thanks for thanks for sharing that, and yeah. thank you for thank you for sitting in today, and thanks for all the kind words about the show, man. I appreciate oh, yeah, it. It's a pleasure. I'll definitely always be listening. Thanks for having me. It was an, the honor was all mine. And you just hold on to one more second. Just hold on to what you have. If you just hold on, just hold on. Hey, everybody, I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Chris Rowe. But don't go anywhere. There's lots more Chris to Makes a Podcast after a few words from our sponsors. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh, yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place, the sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at two designers walk into a bar.com. And listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Hey, everybody. If you like Krista Makes a Podcast, I'm going to assume that you like music podcasts. And if you like music podcasts, check out One Hit Thunder. Each week, we dive into a one hit wonder, and along the way, we gain some knowledge and have some laughs. Lou Bega, Crazy Town, Harvey Danger, The New Radicals, AHA. We're over 100 episodes in now, and to paraphrase the great Matthew Wilder, nothing's going to break our stride. Subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Chris to Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is Goalkeeper, a pop punk band based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, consisting of Ryan Beeb on vocals and bass, Mark Giuliano on guitar, and Cody Ritchie on the drums. Their most recent single was released at the end of August 2022. Here's a snippet of that song, Sooner. Rap with Chris and Chris. So I thought that was a really good episode, Chris. I gotta tell you, this has nothing to do with the episode, really. I love that he name dropped three two one contact really early in the episode. <laughs> Did you used to watch three two one contact when you were a kid? I, you know, I haven't heard that name in over thirty years. If I did watch it, I, I know the name. I don't. I don't recall if I did watch it. I want to say he might have thought been thinking of because Kiss was on. There was a show called Kids Are People Too. And I remember they were on that. They might have been on three, two, one, but uh, yeah, it's it's been a minute. Three, two, one contact was like a science show on PBS. Like, yeah, it was on around the same time as like Sesame Street and stuff. It had a really <laughs> awesome theme song that went three, two, one. Contact is the answer. Obviously, I'm going to put a clip of it right here. Yeah, Chris, when Chris was talking about producer Lou Giordano, it reminded me so much of the same sort of things that you said about Howard Benson. 
I saw a lot of parallels there. Yeah, no, there definitely was. I think that he really taught Chris the use of dynamics and how to build a song. And I learned that from Howard for sure. You know, just Howard's a, a composer first, a keyboardist probably second and a producer third. And that's not a knock against Howard. He's just his composing mind. He reads music and he's a composer. And it sounds like Lou uh, taught Chris a lot of those same fundamentals and dynamics that, that I learned. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I take away the most from this podcast over the past two and a half years or whatever is just building the song and having each part be interesting and more interesting as the song goes along. Uh, that's one thing that I've noticed. That's a through line with so many artists on this show. And it's important, even when I'm in at band practice, you know, with bandmates and, and figuring out a song, be it our own song or even a cover or something, figuring out how we want to present it. Th that's so important to keeping the listener interested in, and having them not just turn it off and be like, all right, I'm bored. Well, that's a great point. And, that, and that's the difference between playing live and making a record. And Chris kind of touched on that saying, you know, we're kind of minimalist live. We don't want to do all these harmonies. Well, yeah, we'll put them on the records. And there's some people that would say, well, why are they on the records? You're not going to do it live. And we were kind of at that mindset. Less than Jake early on was like, you know, this is how we sound. We can't do overdubs and have a piano come in there or have keyboards or anything. We, we don't have those players on stage. It's like, no, there's a difference. You're making a record. It's a completely different thing. And once you can uh, wrap your head around that, it, it op opens up a lot of doors for you. Uh, I thought it was funny when he mentioned, I really related to this. You know how when you're 20 and you think you know everything, but then you're 30 and you look back at 20 year old you and you're like, man, I was an <laughs> idiot. And then, <laughs> and then you, the same thing when you're 40 and you look back on 30 and you're like, I didn't know anything. I hope that continues. I really, because if it starts backpedaling, going like, oh, I was so much smarter when I was 50, when you're 60, that's bad. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I mean, I'm sure you could relate to that too, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you there's uh it's it's if the younger me could know the older me uh scenario you know it's you always look back uh definitely i think you could do you know things better but as long as you don't live in regret and <laughs> you just yeah. know that's where that's where that's where you were at at that point in your life you know yeah that's that's literally what life is <laughs> yeah for sure uh i also thought and related so much to him talking about, you know, with particular lyrics in this song, the breaking into hotel swimming pools definitely did that on the first couple punchline tours. <laughs> Absolutely did that. That was our showers sometimes. Like we couldn't get a hotel room. So it was like, oh, we're going to sneak into the motel pool and like, you know, at least get wet in there <laughs> and, and get out, you know? So I, I thought that was cool. All, oh, all those yeah. early Just tour antics that I'm sure you had too. Absolutely. A lot of stuff he was talking about with the fireworks. And, you know, I, I definitely felt that you could get away with a lot more 20 years ago. Every, everything's at your fingertips now. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it wasn't as easy to call the police in a bonfire without a cell phone 30 years ago, you know. And uh, so I think you got away with a lot, a lot more than, than, than you do now. And hey, I got to tell you, I, I had a, a, a big chuckle, but, you know, I, I, we haven't had a producer that saved someone's life on this show, Chris. Oh, yeah, true. That was a Chris to Makes a Podcast first. It seems like more than anything, this song is a song about living in the moment. And I try to live my life that way. You know, I think that's the only way to live. It's the only thing that actually exists. The, the past already happened. The future isn't here yet. Living in the moment. I think it's cool that when he's writing the song, you know, especially as a younger person, w when he wrote this, that he could step back and realize that, to realize the good times when you're in them. I think that's a kind of a pretty mature way of thinking even when you're young yeah you know and at the end he mentioned the video which you know as you know i research these you know episodes i watch live uh takes on the song i look at the video i try to find demos and in this video he did go back to his original hometown where he grew up of anderson indiana so that's what i thought the song was about i he yeah. completely threw me for a loop when he said this was about tour especially like 2015 riverside you know i i thought that maybe that was his address back in indiana the line of cherry cokes under this moonlight summer sky you know i thought that uh that was maybe referencing his childhood drinking cherry cokes but right. it sounds like he didn't drink till later on the road so he was probably drinking cherry cokes on tour <laughs> yeah and i think it's kind of a good thing that you were taking away a different thing because it's once again it goes down to that thing where the listener can take away from it what they want to take away from it if you were you know an eight-year-old drinking a cherry coke and looking up at the moon you can relate to it that way so the fact that it isn't spelled out so specifically. I actually think that's cooler. 
you know, that you were able to take something aw- else away from it. Absolutely. And something else Chris said, I, I got to tell you, it, it, it's a gamble, but artistically, you got to be able to go to bed and uh, and sleep at night. And, you know, he could have made so long a story apart, too. He took four years between that record and Welcome the Night in 2007 and made a comp. I mean, it didn't sound anything like the Ataris. And he said he had to fulfill his soul, you know, and I I, I, I look at that and go, wow, I, it's commendable, but man, it's, it, it's a gamble. I've, I've never personally done it with my band. It's like there, there's a, a cohesiveness within, but, uh, I thought that was a, a very bold step to take, you know, cause the easy thing to do with a, with a hit album is to do part two of it. And he didn't want to go there. That's a good point. And it, that's the catch 22 of everything, man is like, do you make the same album and have people go like, Oh, it just sounds like their last album. Or do you try something different and have people be like, oh this sucks i like their old stuff like you're kind of screwed either way so you got to follow your own artistic heart and that sounds like what chris did there and i think that's awesome that's right and if uh if you're trying to find your own artistic heart you should hop over to christamakes.com and check out our supporting cast (laughs) yeah sure why not (laughs) i mean you might be inspired artistically if you hear our other podcast chris we've been doing the after party podcast for like I think it's been like a year and a half now. That podcast is its own thing too, that only the people who are part of our supporting cast here. That's pretty crazy that we have like two long running podcasts. So if you're interested in hearing what that one's all about, there are some sneak preview episodes that we've put in the Chris Demakes a podcast feed. You could check those out or better yet, you can just go to ChrisDemakes.com, sign up for the supporting cast. You'll get an entire back catalog of episodes plus weekly new episodes plus you'll be supporting the podcast that you love absolutely christamakes.com to sign up please do if you haven't already check out our krista makes a podcast facebook group with over four thousand members and counting it's a great place to interact we'd love to have you please join and sign up and also we're getting near the holidays i'm still doing custom songs and jingles for you or that special someone hit me up at christamakes at gmail.com and give me a follow on Instagram at less than Chris D. And I want to thank this week's guest, Chris Rowe, for sitting in with us. And we'll see you next week. What's up, everyone? It's Joe, and I'm the host of That's Awesome with Joe, a podcast on the newly formed Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. I talk with tons of your favorite artists, managers, touring personnel, and more. Most of the time we talk about music, but lots of the time we end up talking about something completely unrelated. We laugh a lot. We do a lot of really stupid things, but also some things that are really informative and interesting. Basically, it's a podcast that I think you should listen to. Obviously, I'm biased because it's my podcast, but I think I might be into it if I wasn't the host. Check it out at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, everyone. This is Tuck from Fit for a King, an off-road minivan. Every week, I bring you fun interviews alongside your favorite metalcore entertainers with my new podcast, Get Tucked. Join me every Monday with bands like Counterparts, Crystal Lake, like Moths to Flames, and many more. We play unsigned and undiscovered bands, deep dive into each artist's history, and of course, provide the greatest breakdowns in current metalcore. Tune in to Get Tucked every Monday, out now through Sound Talent Media.